Hey, what's up? It's me, your girl Nia. I am coming to you from Black Exploration with Nia. That's when you literally have a chemical imbalance that is causing the personality defect of narcissism. I only want to talk about this because I have supported men through this. And I know that when men are in dark times, they drink alcohol or they have lots of sex. What value can you bring, can you bring to this person and see in them? So how much did you have to fix your relationship with yourself first in order to have a successful relationship with someone else? Even in the realm of dating. When it comes down to it, people's opinions are not facts, it's just their opinions. Hey, hey guys, it's me, your girl Nia, and we are back with another episode of Black Exploration with Nia. I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for liking. Thank you for sharing. And if you have not downloaded this episode or the podcast in general, please download it and share it with your friends and with your family. We want to make this a movement. We want to bring awareness to self-exploration, especially we celebrate authenticity. So in here, we take our mask off and we are 100% transparent about our healing journey. So I'm excited to have Mr. TJ Sykes here today. He has been not only a client of mine, but really one of the key players when it comes to my safety around discovering relationships with Black men outside of a romantic relationship. So I want to thank you, TJ, for being here, not just being a part of my podcast, but also being a vessel for healing um, other Black women, including myself, when it comes to identifying safe Black men um, in their communities. So before we get started, I want the audience to have a chance to get to know you. So can you please let us know a little bit about what yourself, about what you're doing personally, professionally, and um, just a fun fact about yourself. All uh, right, for sure. Um, so mo most recently, I started working with a different group of kids. I was working at a youth center in Richmond for five years from like 2015 to 2020. Now I'm working at a K through eight in Vallejo um, with young people around like restorative work, um, social emotional learning in the context of school um, and introducing them to different tools that they can utilize to uh, navigate the school space. Um, so that's, that's more on the pro professional uh, as well as um, working with my business, my divine treats, my candy walnut business um, <clears throat> getting them into more stores um, and more locations and vending at different events just to uh, um, get my presence known in the community and whatever community that I'm in. Um, a fun fact about myself. Fun fact about myself is I recently just overcame a, a fear that I have of like being up high and like in high spaces. Mm -hmm. So over the weekend, I was in Reno and my auntie's suite was on the 29th floor. And I was like, nah, I'm not fucking with like that. And then I went up there. And um, yeah, it, it wasn't that bad. It's a lot of <clears throat> like mental things that you have to work through. And I find that when I do stuff like that, it's it might seem small to other people, but it's big to me because I, I translate it to other things in my life that is like, once you stop overthinking, everything starts to flow yeah so dope, yeah. Dope, dope, dope. and a really great intro to what we're going to be talking about today so you know as being a part of the restoring king platform or movie big on balancism and kings balancing themselves out we're in the realm of intimacy spirituality physical and mental health um, and financial freedom so on this podcast we also explore those different facets with the guests that are um, participate, participating in the discussion today. So for the sake of the audience, knowing uh, what journey you're going to take us down, what area would you like to focus today on the podcast? Today, I would like to focus on mental health. Absolutely. 
mental health is such a great uh, cornerstone, especially to advancing the intellect, the emotional intellect and the involvement of the black man psyche. And so I'm excited that you decided to talk about that because it's definitely a current uh, topic that's going to help a lot of black men, especially black women supporting black men or even raising black men um, that are listening to this podcast. So tell me about your wellness journey. How are you folks introducing you in the concept of mental health? Um, and what were some stigmas you had around it before um, starting your self explorational journey into uh, mental wellness? Got you. You said, what well, was some stigmas? And then you said, when was I first introduced to mental health? Yeah, it's in mental health and even, you know, to start your journey. Okay. Um, all right, I'll start off with stigmas. Some of the stigmas that I, you know, heard growing up about, like, I didn't, I didn't really hear the word mental health specifically. Mm -hmm. I just heard of things that was associated with mental health, like therapy. Okay. Growing up, I, like, you know, growing up in a, in a black neighborhood, I think it seems cliche, but we hear that you have to be crazy to go see a therapist. Yeah. And, you know, from my life experience, uh, I would say that you would be crazy not to see a therapist. Yeah. Um, and so from my experience going to therapy, I started my first experience with therapy in the, in the, I guess, um, status quo perspective is when I was 10 years old, when my mother passed, I went to group therapy with other young people who had experienced similar trauma um, with like losing parents and things like that, which was hella helpful to have people that was the same age as me and be able to discuss that and be vulnerable in that space with them. But I think that, <clears throat> I think a lot of times we are, introduced to mental health practices and and mental health tools before we know we even know what it is you know um the activities that we do as children are mental health tools and, and practices and but people don't identify that as that um and i think it's like even simply as going to the going to the park um going swimming going to theme parks these are things that we do as children that bring us joy, that bring us happiness, um, that make us feel free. And I think that all of those are mental health tools. You know, as children, we, we don't know the language for depression. We don't know the language for stress. And these are the ways that we express ourselves and be able to release depression or release stress or connect with other young people um, during an activity that we don't do at home um, and things like that, so. That's you. Yeah, I think that that's a really great point you bring up. Some of the things that I've been just learning through parenting um, is that practicing mindfulness in parenting, is, in parenting is so imperative for parents to raise their children with understanding what mental health is, um, because our children really have those um, psychological effects young. I can even see my son sometimes struggling with his mood management and his um, anger um because he doesn't have really the intellect to like really uh navigate his emotions a lot so so I see him getting really frustrated or like he'll make like his teacher or me or his dad the enemy because he's not taking that personal accountability and so by me just knowing you know the different facets of mental health um, because I've gone through my healing journey now as just being a practitioner, I really start to hold my kids accountable at an early age uh, with their emotional intelligence, especially my son, because I know that by the age of five, um, young boys are taught to really suppress their emotions. And so with Tegan, particularly, I'm teaching him emotional intelligence because that's a really a, for, a formal way of teaching leadership skills. And I think in the Black community, we really stunt ourselves around like our ability to emotionally express ourselves and we're empaths. So would you consider yourself an empath? Yes, absolutely. I was, uh, when, when you asked me that question, I was thinking about introvert and extrovert. But yes, I, I definitely um, consider myself an empath now knowing knowing what an empath is mm -hmm. I didn't 
I, prior to me knowing what an empath was, um, I couldn't um, identify with it because I didn't know what it was. But um, absolutely. Um, and I think for me, the reason why I really couldn't identify it as an empath originally because I thought it was like only connecting with people like feeling feeling sympathy for someone um like who had like a trauma story or things like that and so now I know that empathy is a little deeper than that um and it's it's like you can be around someone and they don't even have to speak and you feel the energy mm -hmm. and that's what empathy is for me as well as if someone tells you a story, a trauma story, you can connect with that. You can connect with those emotions. So, yeah. So for the audience listening, some of us may not know what an empathic person is. From your perspective of being a Black man and, you know, navigating wellness, what is an empath to you? In my own words, an empath is a person or people who can connect with other people's emotions, energy, and, you know, feel it. Um, yeah, and, and feel it and identify with it and be like, okay. So like, if I'm, if I'm interacting with a person, whether they're, they're in a good mood or a bad mood, when I leave their presence, I can still, feel that energy, whether it's good or bad. And I feel like that's empathic. I feel like the opposite of that would be someone who could disconnect from that, who could dis disconnect from the emotions that they're experiencing, disconnect from the emotions that someone else is, is experiencing that's right in front of you. Yeah. And I think that is a really great uh, description for those who are struggling with performance over emotional connection, because part of my biggest hurdle when understanding what empathy was and what being an empath empathic leader was, um, I'm like you too, I'm a natural healer. And so I resonate with people who are hurting, people who are in pain. But as I was self-exploring my own personal wellness journey outside of a trauma narrative, outside of you know, connecting with emotions on the negative, in a negativity, uh, in a negative space, you know, dealing with negativity, I realized that being an empathic leader also means being able to connect with people on a higher state of consciousness that have those um, higher emotional states like happiness, joy, freedom, creativity, um, autonomy. Those are also uh, great ways to show your empathy. And what I've noticed since I've been living my life outside of my trauma narrative is that I'm able to connect to those higher level of consciousness. And then when I am able to connect with those ways of being around other people, I started to realize how, how crucial it was to have positive people and healthy people in my life to also maintain my mental wellness. Um, I think that there's an isolative way to deal with mental health, just so you can get in your own baseline, find out what your own balance and your own flow state is. But I think that as you start to evolve outside of your trauma narrative, community is a really huge uh, component of that. And so on your wellness journey, can you tell me a little bit about like how you were before versus how you are now when it comes to your wellness journey? I know that there's always a starting point, there's a middle and there's no end to it, but there's an end where you feel comfortable to just come out and be yourself, self-expressed, self self-actualized self. self, -self, -self. So for the sake of the listeners who are listening, who, you know, they're on their wellness journey and they're like, okay, so I've gotten to the point where I know who I am. I know what different facets I need to work on. When did you start to realize that your vibe is your tribe? Mm. <laughs> um, let me think. Mm. I think of the age I was when I realized the, I guess maybe like, maybe like 18 or 20 around that time when I really, I, I think it's been like levels to it where it's like, all right, I kind of got a little bit of it. 
here. And then as I get older, it's, it's, it, I'm getting more and more understanding of like, okay, if I'm up here, if my, if my vibration is high, then, so right now I'm learning that I can create a space where people have to come here instead of I go there. Mm -hmm. So um, they have to learn how to vibrate higher to get to where I'm at, to have a conversation with me or just be in a room with me, you know? And um, it's not a, like a cocky thing. It's just like a, a, a wellness thing. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I'm not, I'm not going to engage in that type of conversation. I'm not going to engage in that type of activities just because I know how it impacts my wellness, my mind, my heart, my spirit. Like it don't bring me joy. Um, it's not beneficial to my household um, and these things. And so as the years has gone on and I've met these different healthy people that's mm -hmm. my life, whether it's a therapist or whether it's a coach or whether it's just a, a elder or whether it's somebody that's my age that's just on the healing journey, um, starting to recognize these things, who I want to be around, who can I call in this time of need. Um, really, uh, one thing that I've really been honing in for the last like two years is asking for help and what does that look like? Um, who can I ask for help for what is certain people who can, who I can ask for help for certain things. Like if you're a therapist, then I'm not going to ask you for help on certain things. If that makes sense. I wouldn't ask you specifically for support with herbs. If that's not your if that's not your lane, you might know a few things, but if that's not your lane, then I'm going to go to someone that I know that's an herbalist. Makes sense, makes sense. So, you know, I, I, a part of empathic leadership in that capacity as far as wellness, as you pick up on energy and energy is very sacred. So I think that people in the Black community specifically don't really understand that. And so we do, they do a lot of what I like to call trauma bonding where they're so used to being at a certain uh, vibration when it comes to negativity that they actually put people around them and in place, not intentionally. Some people do intentionally, um, but a lot of this is done unconsciously to keep you at that baseline. And part of uh, my wellness journey specifically, what I had to really learn how to do was regulate my nervous system to stop operating off of stress triggers because stress used to be a motivator for me as far as productivity. It used to be a motivator as far as relationship. And I, if I didn't have a certain stress level in my relationship, then that means they didn't love me. Uh, how I interacted with my, my family, it was a motivator. So like, if I get to a certain level of stress and I'll get up all this energy and I'll like be literally like dry, thriving off of stress um, mm -hmm. to get to those next goals. And um, that's, not, that's not sustainable, nor is it healthy because it's, it's releasing a lot of toxic uh, serotonin in your, into your bloodstream and it just really stunts your growth. And so one of the biggest things on the RC wellness platform is that we really want to uh, explore and motivate people to live life outside of trauma narratives. So tell the audience, how has wellness helped you to live life outside of your trauma narrative? And what was your trauma narrative prior to uh, starting your, uh, your journey? So ask the question, uh, it was, what was the trauma narrative prior to the journey? And then what was the other question? Uh, the other question was around, uh, how did you, like, that's a good question. I'm, I just was in, just a, in a flow state of, of wanting to know that. But that's just, let's just talk about life outside of your trauma narrative. When did you, right. What did you realize what your, what your trauma narrative was and how has life been outside of that? All right, for sure. So. So my trauma narrative was you're a black boy growing up in Richmond. Um, so nine times out of 10, you're not gonna make it to C18. And so that's how I lived. I lived like day to day, not thinking about the future because tomorrow not promised to, and yesterday is gone already. And so like, I didn't really, I was just, I was just existing for so long, I was just existing um doing what other people do not really tapping into my potential and 
once I turn 18, it's like, bro, so what you going to do for the next 18 years of your life? Is you going to waste it thinking like uh, having this fear-based thinking around like, oh, I might not make it. And so like once I really start tapping in with my mental health, once I start being around higher vibrational beings that show me like there's more to life. One of, one of my life-changing moments was I was, um, I think I was like 18 or 19 and I was working for an organization and it was an opportunity from another organization. I had knew, I knew the director of the other organization. They knew me and they knew of my work. And they was like, we don't have a representative to represent our network in Texas. Would, would you like to go to represent us? And I was like, yeah. And I had never flew on a plane. I had already told myself that I was never gonna fly on a plane, but here was this opportunity that I, I just didn't want to miss it. And so I was like, yep. And so that was my first time ever flying. I went to San Antonio, Texas for this experience that was life-changing, that um, connected with me with people all over the country that I'll forever have relationships with. Um, and so, that was like, I feel like that was one of the things that shifted my mind around like fear, around like flying and things like that. And so after that, it's kind of, it just kind of been opened up. Like the portal of a flow has kind of been opened up around fear. I'm like, nah, I need to do more things. <laughs> and if, if I don't make it, I won't make it. But then while I'm here, I got to do, I got to travel. I have to meet new people, I have to build relationships. Um, I have to show people the process that I'm going through um, and that I've gone through to get where I'm at. Absolutely, so I was listening to this podcast because I'm really into uh, neurolinguistics, I'm also into neuroscience. And they were talking about how there's three ways that people can either stunt their growth and development and um, essentially die early or they can expand it. It's in a form of what you eat, your stress level, um, and also to how, who you surround yourself by. Now, we talked about the importance of having your tribe as your vibe and how those things can actually expand to your consciousness. Tell us a little bit more about um, healthy, healthy eating habits. Like on your wellness journey, has your diet played a key component in you healing? Mm. Yeah, um, so... I am, I'm vegan, so I don't eat any meat, any dairy products, any, so I try not to eat any soy either, and um, so what really got my, me started on this journey before I even know that I was starting on this journey was growing up, I had migraines um, when I was in school, like, started in, like, middle school, all the way through high school, I had these migraines where my vision would change, and then I know I, I knew that that was a trigger like a light would trigger my vision to change. And then I knew like I was about to have a migraine. And I, I never went to the hospital cause I never really liked going to the hospital. Well, I went a few times and they didn't, they weren't able to do nothing. So after that, I just stopped going to the hospital and I would just go to sleep. And so the thing that changed that was, um, I found out that I was dehydrated. And so I started to drink way more water and I try to drink like a gallon of water a day or close to it and I cut off I cut off sodas I didn't drink any sodas anymore because that was my favorite drink I would drink Tahiti and treat sodas Kool-Aid and all of these different sugary drinks and so that was the first thing in terms of like eating or drinking that was the first shift that I made was um drinking more water and I noticed from that shift, I didn't have any more headaches because I was obviously hydrated. The next thing that I did was I cut off pork and then I cut off ground beef and then I cut off ground turkey, then chicken and then fish and then dairy. And so that was kind of my, that was kind of my process. And now I'm here. So essentially it was more like a trickle down effect. It wasn't like a, a certain juxtaposition to where you just went from like eating cold turkey, right? Change your eating habit. It was more so like a, 
um, I have a communication with your body, your brown, what gets to go, what, what gets to stay, and in, in what time does that happen? Um, and I think that's in, in, in really in, uh, important and imperative because a lot of uh, our diet has to do with our cultural standing, our body uh, biochemistry, um, and it's all about balance. It's all about balance, especially when you're trying to eat, not for aesthetics, you're trying to eat for wellness. So like part of my regimen is I'm pescatarian because my body wants fish. It wants seafood. Now, um, turkey, chicken, those things, mm, not so much. I'm not really like too pinned up, pinned up on that. But if I go too long without eating uh, some type of fish or some type of like see something my family is west african so i just think that biochemistry that's just in our natural nature to eat something uh, as far as like uh uh seafood goes or maybe i've just grown up on seafood for so long it's just a part of my psyche but when i was on my wellness journey i was trying to so i was vegetarian for three years and then my body just started craving fish um and then i went to to fish again and so um, I just want to, you know, I'm just bringing that out there because everybody's uh, wellness journey is different. It's contingent upon really having a lot of bio uh, chemistry awareness um, and really getting to know your body outside of like what you want to look like or what somebody else is doing. So I just want to say shout out to you for allowing your body to explore that and coming up with a regimen that, that works for you. Now, as a vegan, what are your two top dishes that you like to eat? Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, I say like garbanzo beans. So anything with garbanzo beans, like hummus or soup or garbanzo bean burger, something like that. Seaweed has been something else. Like it's not like a, a dish per se, but it's like it's more of a snack that's really good. And, and then salads. Yeah, salads. Yeah, them like my main things. But and then in terms of fruit. Right now, the season is here. Watermelon is my top fruit that I just love. Watermelon, mangoes, cherries, them like the top three for me, especially around this season. My birthday, June 5th, I'm a summer baby. So them them the summer fruits that I really resonate with. Other than that, see the grapes is, is a good one too. Absolutely. And those are all great um, ways that people can cook costs in their in their food and groceries because right now we're in a pressing time where gas is six dollars and 49 cents right so we gotta be eating from home and try to cut corners as much as you can and i feel like you know a, a part of wellness is being able to be um very very uh frugal it, it helps in so many other areas around like how much you spend your money and fast food is it, it costs a lot, right, to maintain that lifestyle too. So it's like, what do you want to spend your money towards, longevity or short-term gain? And it really has a lot to do with your patience. And so when you are um, coming from a vegan standpoint or just a wellness standpoint and you're eating, it helps in so many different ways. Um, so I want to thank you again for being a part of um, the podcast. I want to learn more about your initiatives and what you're doing um, I know you're doing so many amazing things. You have your own um, uh, business that you're doing. Let the audience know like where they can find you and tell us a little bit about your initiatives and what you have going on personally. All right, for sure. Real quick, I want to say like, I also feel like the way that I eat and I live has um, helped my hair grow like this. Like it's only a year and six months of growth. I started with a little Afro and I got my hair twisted in I just, when I be looking in the mirror, I'm like, God dang, I just got my hair rehit like two weeks ago. And it's like, yeah, it's really just blossoming. So, and I only use like black castor oil in my hair. So yeah, it ain't no like special products or nothing like that. I just do what I do, keep it moisturized and leave it alone. Um, so right now I'm looking to expand my business, my divine treats business um, into more stores. So I've been connected with more stores. I recently got into a store in Berkeley called the Student Berkeley Student Collective. So it's a it's a student ran grocery store. Um and so yeah I'm I'm just really looking at yeah expanding the business and expanding my team. I'm a one one person team right now, but I'm I'm looking for 
I'm looking forward to connecting with like an accountant. I think that would be a good um, first person to connect with in terms of that. So I can have my my books in order uh, because I feel like that's where I need the most support at. Um, I'm still in the process of working on my second book. I am a published author. Uh, I know you know that, but everybody else don't know that. Um, my first book was published in 2018. It's, it's entitled Section 8. Uh, it's based on my lived experience in low-income housing. And it's a graphic novel, so it's images for uh, all of the words. It's images. And, um, what else am I working on? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing guided meditations. Um, we just finished a 12-week session with Nia and her platform collaborating with uh, with them and uh, it was dope. Um, I appreciate y'all for allowing me to hold space like that in that way. Um, it's transform transformational and I look forward to working with other folks. I think that is it. Um, you can find me if you could just Google my name, TJ Sykes, I'll pop up. But um, my Instagram is underscore TJ Sykes. That's my personal one. My um, treats page is Divine Treats 2020. And then I have my book page is tj.section.8. And then my website is TJ Sykes Divine biz. So it's T J S Y K E S D I V I N E dot B I Z. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I definitely guess that 12 week series was transformational personally for me too. And I'll just give my feedback on it. Um, we explored the chakras and I was introduced to a different level of energetic transfers that like, I believe opened me up to a different uh, level of consciousness and having a guided uh, meditative experience really helped me get more into with my body and I've just been on an energetic up since then so if anyone is looking for a, a guided meditation practitioner TJ's is the truth like um, I'm going to also bring him back to my platform so he can continue to service my clients but if you guys are looking for someone who's really in tune with their meditative uh, spirit uh, TJ is going to be the one for you so before we get off I like to ask what can our listeners expect from you in five years? Like in five years from this day, what can our listeners be looking out for you to have going, accomplished, or um, in the works? All right. In 2027, because that's that's five years from now, 2027. Um, so I'm not, I'll say I have at least two more books out um i'll be traveling worldwide doing guided meditations as well as performing poetry and selling books and my treats will be uh in stores across the country um let me see what else i have some kids some biological kids i got some non-biological kids they all spread around the bay area um but yeah i have some biological kids in a in a in a dope beautiful partner uh, I own a house and some property and what else yeah, yeah something like that that's dope that's dope so last question if you were an instrument what type of instrument would you be and why saxophone I love the saxophone um the the way that I feel when I hear the saxophone play is, is like being in a trance. It's like being in a meditative space that um, it's really peaceful, it's really calming. Uh, yeah, and I know it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of healthy lung capacity to even blow that thing. <laughs> so yeah, I'll be, I'll be a saxophone. What about you? Absolutely. Actually, I'll be a flute um, because I'm gentle. I'm making loud noises. So I can either be nice, warm, and soft, or I can be hard and loud. It just depends on how you play me. So that's what I choose. And I just want to say thank you so much um, for being a part of my narrative 
um, for just being a healer out here, helping our people, for being a fellow Richmond native, um, and for continuing on um, with being an empathic leader. So that's going to do it for us today. I want to thank my audience for listening again. Remember, this is all about authenticity. So if you are looking to join the podcast and share your authentic healing story, please click the link in my bio to register to be a participant. Also, I want to encourage you to like, follow, and share these self-explorational journeys because this is the beginning to something big. So if you have been rocking with me from day one, I want to give a major shout out to you and send your questions in. This is an interactive um, platform. We want to know from you. We want to hear from our audience. This is all about authenticity. And I can't be authentic and transparent with all of you guys. So thank you again for being a part of my network. And that's going to that's gonna do it for us on another episode of Black Exploration with Mia. Peace.